Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see you all back, and we got one program, and uh, we're out of here before again today. So, those of you joining us on television, we'd just like to welcome you to an informal Bible study, and again, as I've said so often, we're not underwritten by anyone. We are just totally dependent on the Lord supplying, and my, how you do it. Uh, we just want to thank you from the depths of our heart for the response from our listening audience. Uh, financially, prayer-wise, as well as your letters of encouragement. Now, uh, we're going to hopefully bring this series to the point that I wanted to bring it to show you without a doubt that we can believe and trust in a pre tribulation outcalling, or what we call the rapture of the church. But uh, I want to make a few comments on the last half hour program that I didn't really end up the way I think I should have. But uh, we're going to go back and start with Romans chapter 7, verses 5 and 6, because you see, you cannot do anything in the Lord's service <clears throat> except the Holy Spirit leads you and empowers you. And uh, we have to show the scripture to do that. So if you'll bear with me now and come back to Romans chapter 7, and then we'll go back again into 1 Corinthians. And then hopefully the rest of the hour we're going to show how we can be expectantly looking for that outcalling, the trumpet call, the rapture, whatever you want to call it. All right, let's turn to Romans chapter 7 and drop in at verse 4. Oh, yeah. Iris is reminding me again. We are in the last part of book number 72. Is that right? Yeah, book 72. In fact, this whole book will be more or less on this dispensational bit, isn't it? That's right. I've forgotten that. This whole series of 12 programs, we've been dealing with why we can look at a pre-trib rapture. Okay, Romans chapter 7, dropping in at verse 4. Wherefore? My brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, the work of the cross, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. In other words, it's to be a works element that brings forth more believers. Now verse 5. For when we were in the flesh, as we saw earlier this afternoon, every one of us were at one time in the lost estate. For when we were in the flesh, the motions or acts of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. That's the great white throne judgment. Verse 6, But now, for you and I as believers, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter, that is, the law. All right, now then, the other verse that I've got to look at a minute before we go any further is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, which is all tied to this same premise, that the moment we believe, the Holy Spirit came within us to indwell us, but he also baptized us into the body of Christ, which, as I said, I think in the first program this afternoon, that's the only one that counts for eternity. Are you a member of the body of Christ? I don't care what other churches you're a member of. That doesn't really count. Are you a member of this body of Christ, which only the Holy Spirit can determine who goes in? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll just jump right in at verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit, see there it is again, the Holy Spirit, we as believers now, <clears throat> we are all, every last one of us, baptized or placed into, not a denomination, but what? The body. We are placed into the one body, <clears throat> whether we be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, we have been all made 
to drink into or partake of that one Spirit. And then that indwelling Holy Spirit prompts us then to produce fruit for eternity and to be laborers in this building that God has commissioned us to build. And so never forget that we cannot perform any work for God except the Holy Spirit who leads us and directs us and empowers us. All right, now then we've been pointing to the fact that all of these things that I've been talking about, everything is all tied up in this period of time that we call the dispensation of the grace of God. That's why I looked at Ephesians 3. Well, I also had Sharon put up all these references. You can take them down, hopefully, if you can see them, that all refer to that word mystery, as Paul uses the term, which means a secret. Romans 11.25 we used earlier. Royal, no, I didn't either. I read 16.25. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret. We looked at uh, Ephesians 1.9 and all these, and take them down in your notes if I don't have time to address them this afternoon. These are all words, verses that have no bearing on anything of this upper timeline. This is all associated with the dispensation of grace. Now again, remember, the Old Testament line came through and they all thought it would just keep right on going past the ascension and they'd go into the tribulation. That would end with the second coming and the establishment of the kingdom. But unknown to all of this, was this break in the timeline right after his ascension when God called out the Apostle Paul and sent him to the Gentiles, opened up this dispensation of grace. And so everything that I've been trying to teach now for the last 12 programs is to show that that will never mix with the Jewish economy of the tribulation. It'd be like putting gasoline and water. It just won't mix. And if people could just ask God, open my eyes, help me to see this, that all the things that Paul teaches between Romans and Philemon are never addressed anywhere else in Scripture. You can't find it. You've heard me say it over and over. Well, if that be the case, then how can you take something that is so totally insulated from all of this up here, and then in the last minute, go ahead and push it into the tribulation. I can't see how it can work. It would be, again, like I said, like fish out of water, like mixing gas and oil. It won't work. And so we have to realize that this whole outcalling of what we call the body of Christ is a Pauline revelation of things kept secret. And I emphasize that, I think, in several programs back, that God is a God who keeps secrets. Deuteronomy 29, 29, over and over. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us. Well, how can something belong if it's never been revealed? Well, it can't. And these things were never revealed until we come to Paul, who was sent to the Gentile world. So you just keep it, the word I use over and over, it's insulated. It is insulated. You can't push any of the Jewish economy into it, except as Paul uses some of the Old Testament characters as examples. Abraham was an example of faith plus nothing, and uh, various other. But to make any doctrinal out of it, it just will not fly. And so I am adamantly maintain that since this dispensation of the grace of God, our own set of directions, you can't put it up with Israel in the tribulation. It just won't fly. Okay, now then, let's look at our key verses where Paul teaches, and Paul alone, you won't find it anywhere else. Let's start in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. And right off the bat, what's the first word going to jump off the page at you? 
What word? Mystery. See? A mystery. One of these verses that we've got on the board. 1 Corinthians 15.51. What does it say? Behold, I show you a mystery. A secret. That's never been revealed before. Now, I'll give you a good example. And I was just as guilty as everybody else. Keep your hand in 1 Corinthians and go back to John chapter 14. Yeah, John 14. I thought for a minute I didn't have the right chapter, but it's the verse I wanted. John 14, starting right at verse 1. And I dare say that 75, 80, I don't know, 90% of even people who believe in the rapture will put this as rapture ground. Cannot be. It cannot be. Why? Because the rapture was a secret, never been revealed until God gave it to Paul. Well, what's the time factor of John 14? Years earlier. This is Jesus in his earthly ministry. He's not talking about the rapture. Now look at the language that I used to do it, so I know what I'm talking about. Verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again that you may be and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. That's not the rapture. That's God dealing with the twelve. See? And that'll happen at his second coming. And various other scriptures. Two women grinding at the mill. One taken and the other left. How many people think that's the rapture? No, that's not the rapture. That's God dealing with a couple Jews. And if you really study the scripture, the one that's taken is not the believer, it's the unbeliever. And the believer is left to go into the kingdom. Two shall be sleeping in the bed, one taken and the other left. Well, which one is taken? The unbeliever. Because it's not going to go into the kingdom, only the believer can. And see how we can twist the scriptures? But you just separate them like I started out in the first program, rightly divide the word of God, and then everything gets just as plain as the noonday sun. All right, but now back to 1 Corinthians 15. And watch the language. It's all you have to do. God has made sure that these things are plainly understood. Behold, I show you a mystery, a secret, something that's never been revealed before. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Now just stop and think a minute. See, that's what I got to get people to do. Stop and think. If there's coming a point in time, whether you want to believe in a pre-trib rapture or not, there's coming a point in time when God is going to intervene in human history, which means that there's going to be some believers who are still what? Living. Got me? I don't care when it is. There's going to be a time when, when Christ comes, there will be believers who are living. They haven't died. So what does this verse say? They're not going to die so they can be resurrected. God's going to do what? He's going to change them. Metamorphosis. Now I know that's not a good illustration because it's so slow. But you all know what metamorphosis is, don't you? When that cocoon finally opens up and out comes that gorgeous butterfly... What a transformation. Well, that's the way I like to liken our being changed if the Lord should come today. We're alive. He's not going to kill us so he can resurrect us. He's going to change us immediately before we hit the ceiling. See? Now, I think I shared one of my classes someplace lately. I had just read an article which was way over my head, but I got enough out of it to be able to correlate it. He was talking about we live in three dimensions, but science is now aware there are probably as many as 11 or 12. And when you get into that 11th or 12th dimension, nothing can prohibit anything else from going through it. Bingo. That's what we're going to do. 
If that's what it takes, we're going to slip from three-dimensional to 12-dimensional before we hit the ceiling. And we're out of here. No problem. But all right, the point I'm making, there has to be a point in time when the trumpet sounds and Christ calls up the believers of the church age, Old Testament are going to have to wait. Daniel says that that's going to have to wait until after the uh, second coming. But for the church age believer, there's coming a day, the trumpet's going to sound, Christ is going to leave heaven, and we who are alive will be changed. Okay, now let's read on. Verse 52, in a moment, in a split second, in the twinkling or the blink of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, he's repeating it now, who are alive and remain shall be changed. We're going to go from the ugly cocoon to the beautiful butterfly. Instantly. See? And we shall be changed. For this corruptible, which is prone to death, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on M mortality. All right, now you have to understand here then that the believing, what's the word I'm trying to think of? The Christian who was a believer when he died is going to have to be resurrected into a new body. That's resurrection power. We can all understand that. All right, so the soul and spirit that went to glory the minute that believer died, that's 2 Corinthians 5 again, that soul and spirit went into the presence of the Lord waiting for this great resurrection day. All right, and when Christ returns to the air with a trumpet, a singular trumpet, not the seven of Revelation, a singular trumpet, God's trumpet, and then the dead in Christ will be resurrected from wherever they are, whether they're in the deepest cavern in the ocean, whether they were burned at the stake, or no matter where, there's going to be enough of that corpse left that God can resurrect it. I don't care if it's only an atom. That's all God needs. But he does have to have that. Because, you see, you can't resurrect from nothing. That's the whole idea of resurrection. That you've lived and died and resurrected. And that has to be by an act of God, but he knows, don't you worry, there is not a cell of any believer that God doesn't know where it is. All right, let's just read another verse or two here. I think we have time. Verse 54, so when this corruptible, this body that is fit for death and corruption, even though we're saved in the soul and the spirit, now that's another half hour, isn't it? We know that the body will not receive the incorruption until resurrection. Let me show you the verse. I think i got time. Come back with me to Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And here we have the appearance of the kingdom the second coming, the curse lifted, and everything goes back to perfection of the Garden of Eden. And I haven't got time to read them all, but let's go down to verse 22. Romans 8, verse 22. If you want to read this after you get home, go all the way up to verse 18. But I haven't got time to do that, so let's start verse 22. For we know that the whole creation, everything in it, whether it's alive or whether it's inanimate, everything is under the curse and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, not all the other parts of creation, but ourselves also, we as believers, are part of the curse. We suffer pain. We cover sick and disease and what have you. All right? And not only there, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption or that great transition to what? The redemption of our body. The soul and spirit was redeemed at salvation. 
But our old body is still part of the old curse. It's still prone to sickness and disease and injury and whatever. But the day is coming. We're going to get a new body and it'll be reunited with the soul and the spirit. All right, now then, I think in the seven minutes we have left, I'm going to take you all the way over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the companion passage, as I call it. And again, you'll never find language like this anywhere except Paul. Nowhere. It is insulated from all the rest of Scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant. And there's no need. It's not in gobbledygook. It's not in some language that you can't understand. It's plain English. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who have died. Or if you've got a King James, the word is asleep. It just simply means physical death. That you, who sorrow, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. In other words, he's telling his believers, if you've loved a, lost a loved one who was a believer, don't sorrow like those pagans. You're going to see your loved one again. We are. We're going to see our loved ones if they were believers, and we're going to know them. Now, verse 14. Look how simply put this is. If we believe, that Jesus died and rose again. We're qualified. What is that? Well, that's the gospel. See? If we believe that Christ died and rose again, that's the gospel. Then what? Then those who sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. They too, we trust, have believed the gospel. So here we have the whole complement of the believers of the body of Christ, whether they were alive or whether they've died and gone on to be the Lord, we're all going to come in under this great resurrection day. All right, now then, verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord. Now hold it. Where is he getting all this? From the ascended Lord. I can just about hear him. Paul, this is what I want you to write. When we had our Aegean cruise, we had a, a guy who was, I don't know what you call him, an actor. He was a dramatist. And he acted out in various stages of our cruise, the Apostle Paul. And he was good. Why? Well, I just sat back and enjoyed it. Bill, you remember that. And uh, on one of his presentations, he went through First and Second Timothy, wasn't it? A whole, the whole books of Timothy, as if Paul was dictating to his secretary. And, oh, it was tremendous. All right, now that's how Paul received all this. The ascended Lord from glory gave him every word, see? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, verse 15, that we who are alive and remain. Now remember, I've stressed over the years that Paul thought he was going to live to see this great day. He didn't think it was going to be 1,900 years away. So he says, those of us who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede or go ahead of them who have died or are asleep. Why? Verse 16. For the Lord himself, Jesus the Christ, shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Believers who have died. Beginning, I think, with Saul's conversion. That's where I feel the body began. You don't have to agree with me, but that's where I feel it began, that when God saved Saul, and opened up to him the ministry to the Gentile world. That also was the beginning then of this body of Christ who were saved, remember, by verse 14, by believing that Jesus died and rose again. Anybody before Paul had never heard of such a thing. All right, now then, verse 17. Then, after the dead have been resurrected, reunited body, soul, and spirit, then... We who are alive, believers, as if this should happen today, 
<clears throat> we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. We'll be gathered, as he says in 2 Thessalonians. Or, as we use the word coined, we'll be raptured, which simply means the same thing. We'll be snatched off the planet. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, those who have been resurrected from the dead and have their new resurrected body. The whole body of believers now is gathering around the Christ who is in the, somewhere in the atmosphere. He doesn't come to the planet. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. And then if you don't believe it, go into chapter 5, and here you have those who are left behind, according to the series of the books, the, time, the, the title. All right, but of the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write on you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the tribulation, the coming in of the Antichrist cometh as a thief in the night. For when they, not us, not when we, when they, the left behinds, they will say, peace and safety. Now, isn't that exactly what the Antichrist is going to promise when he first comes? Oh, he's going to be a flatterer. He's going to promise peace and prosperity. Israel will think he's the Messiah because of what he's accomplishing. But what happens next? Sudden destruction. Sudden destruction and the horrors of the tribulation will unfold. All right, now we've got to quickly run another page on to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And here again, the language is so plain that the Antichrist cannot appear until after we've experienced this being caught up. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. Now at the second coming, he comes to the planet. Here he draws the believer off the planet. It's a simple change in language. And so we can rest assured that before the Antichrist can make his appearance, the body of Christ has has to be taken away, and then everything can go back to the top timeline that we have on the board. All the prophecies will finally be fulfilled, but we're out of here. We're with the Lord in glory, and the more we look about it, the more excited we can get. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.